Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. <laughs> okay. Hi, how you doing? If you're new, please say new in the chat box. But um, uh, I just want to tell you really quickly <laughs> who I am. I'm Christine Elder, and I'm a naturalist and visual artist and environmental educator uh, living in Central Oregon, where today it's sunny and cool and beautiful. So I um, I love rodents, and that's what we're talking about today. Here I am with a couple of my favorite rodents. So today's workshop is all about rodents, and I love to um, sketch them as well in the field, of course. If you're new, you might not know, but um, I love to travel, and I love to sketch in the field, and I love to teach people like you how to have ease and confidence for sketching. And part of that is, of course, your actual uh, tools you use and practice. And the other part is actually uh, understanding the structure uh, and biology, anatomy, ecology of the thing we're drawing. So that's why we're drawing um, and talking about rodents today and squirrels. Okay, hello, Kirsten and Jacqueline and uh, Maria. Yes, and Eileen, great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, yeah, Milana will be coming. Yeah, she can uh, watch the recording. You can always watch the recording, but it's more fun, at least for me, if you join live, because then you can be in the chat box over there and ask and answer questions, and you can uh, share your sketches. Okay. So let's see. So this is how we roll. If you're new, uh, my goals, uh, like I'd mentioned, were to um, inspire you about the natural world with the nature sketching process and uh, learning a little bit about the uh, wildlife of the day, which today is rodents and squirrels. Our resources are down below. I actually added a couple bonus ones. So that's a new link. And I sent that to you about an hour ago. So hopefully you got that. Um, you know where the chat box is. Please say new if you're new in the chat box. I don't see uh, very many new people, I don't think, but uh, we're a really friendly group here. I've done over 150 of these live workshops, and a lot of you have been with me since the very beginning. And so uh, it's a really friendly group here, and we're all super supportive. So we're going to do our presentation, our slideshow um, about squirrels and other rodents, and we'll do um, our step-by-step -step demonstration, um, a, a couple of them. We'll do some quick sketching and live sketching, and then we'll do our longer sketch of this guy. I actually did a couple versions of him. And um, yeah, then we'll share. So, oh, Jean Walker, thank you for joining. And Grace, thank you for coming. Yes. So um, I love at the end, if you're brave enough to share your screen, you got to um, be in the chat box and say, hi, I want to share. And then we can share your screen and you can um, show us your beautiful, happy face. And you can um, ask any questions you want or share your sketches. Okay, great. Yes, Mary Ellen, thanks for welcoming uh, Jean and Grace. Yeah, I told you we were a great friendly group here. Okay, so again, today's workshop is on squirrels and other rodents. <laughs> Fascinating subject. Okay, and so um, specifically today's plan is we're going to learn facts about the um, rodent order. Uh, it's the largest order with over 2,000 species, and it's about 40% of all mammals. <laughs> um, so we're going to do a quick survey of some species from around the world. So you'll get kind of a, um, a bird's eye, 10,000 foot view of the group and some of the families. Then we're going to do some quick pencil sketching, gesture sketching, uh, because again, I want you guys to get used to just sketching really quickly and not being too judgmental about yourself, capturing that squirrel in your backyard. <laughs> and um, having some skill and confidence in doing that. And then we're gonna create our pencil drawing of this of this tree squirrel again. And yeah, we'll spend about 30 minutes on uh, him or her, <laughs> whichever it is. Okay, so our suggested art materials, basically just some whatever paper you have available or sketchbooks. Um, let's see, I was sketching earlier in this book. I have a ton of different sketchbooks, but this is one of my sketchbooks, Fabriano, and I was doing some of these quick one minute sketches. So today I am uh, just demonstrating with a colored pencil, although you can use whatever you want um, and trying to choose some mammal colored pencils. And I'm going to start out with a pretty dull pencil so you don't get too lost in the, in the, in the weeds, right? So we can just stay light and loose and, um, not be too fine tipped, but it really doesn't matter what you use. 
Okay, great. Hi, Joji. Hi, Catherine from the Finger Lakes. Oh, I love that area. Gone to a conference there at Ithaca, New York, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Okay, anyway, yeah, and then you'll want a sharpener since um, we're going to want to use these both sharp and dull for um, our gesture sketches, dull and um, sharp for our more detailed sketch. Okay, let's see, what else am I doing here? Okay, and then uh, at that link below that I also just sent you in the email, I gave you a couple extra handouts. One of them is this, what I call this um, drawing helper template. Let me make that bigger for you. So that's where you can create a value scale, practice value scales, and using a viewfinder, you can cut those all out. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about those as we go, but uh, a lot of you guys have worked with those with me before. Okay, and then, um, and then your handouts. So we've got the one page here that we're gonna be drawing from today. We're gonna draw this squirrel that's uh, looking at us. He looks like he's a little bit worried or something, <laughs> clutching his little waist to himself. And then you can practice sketching this one on the tree later. And then I had this bonus one that I'd already made for a different project um, on ground squirrels, if you want to download that later. But we'll just be demonstrating with this one. Okay. Okay. So let's get going. Characteristics of the order rodentia. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, um, just put them in the chat box. I can see the chat box right here. So it's easy for me to um, look at that. Uh, so again, we're looking at this large order of rodents and, um, this is actually part of a year long series where every month I'm doing a different mammal and I'll mention that a little bit later, but anyway, um, we're working on the order rodentia this month, uh, because again, like I said before, it's a huge order. It's the largest one with about 40% of all mammal species, over 2000 species. And um, the most unique thing about them is their teeth. Uh, and so they have one pair of incisors in each of their upper and lower jaws. So we have two pairs um, and then we have uh, incisors or um, uh, canines and premolars and molars and that kind of thing. So they just have two on top and two on the bottom. So yeah, like thinking about the beaver or the squirrel or anything like that. And they grow continuously and they have more um, of this hardening enamel on the outside than the inside. And so that makes them wear to a really sharp chisel shape. And they keep growing all their life because um, they need to eat. And a lot of what they eat, like beavers um, and porcupines eating wood, uh, they would wear down really quickly if they didn't grow continuously. So these incisors grow continuously. And then they have this big gap here. This is called a diastema. So if you were to find this skull in the forest, it would really be easy for you to identify it as a rodent skull. Um, with that big uh, hole there. And they can actually um, squeeze their lips kind of between there um, so that when they're chewing, like for example, again, the uh, beaver um, chewing a tree down, they're not going to get it in their, their mouth. Those incisors is a separate tool and unrelated to actually eating. So they can close their lips behind this in this big gap called the diastema. And then they have different kinds of um, molars, uh, depending on the style uh, of their life. And you can actually um, read a, a book. I have a book on uh, a key to mammal skulls. It will tell you all about how to identify any different rodent, but it's mainly by the shapes of these molars. And then they have a really big jaw here and a um, big um, uh, bone here where all the muscles attach of the jaw the, the jaw closing and chewing muscles so that they can do that. Oh yeah, Jacqueline, we'll move on to that. Remind me a little bit later. Okay. So, so um, the word rodent actually comes from the Latin rodere or to gnaw. And so obviously they're using those pairs of incisors to uh, chew. And some of them have really big cheek bat, um, pouches too, like this chipmunk. So they're eating a wide variety of food, depending on the species, um, mostly uh, herbivores. Um, but uh, sometimes they do eat invertebrates like spiders and worms and, um, you know, flies. Tiny insects and that kind of thing as well. 
and here they are eating some more. <laughs> and so this is the characteristic pose that you're often going to see them in because they have a super high metabolism and a really small body. So they have to eat a lot in order to stay warm enough. And so this is the characteristic pose that you're generally going to see them in and you're going to sketch them in where they're uh, holding some kind of food item, a nut or a, or a fruit or an apple carrot here like this marmot, um, and eating. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, they're all over the world and their body styles really vary depending on their habits and, and their habitats. And I talk about that more in my, uh, online course called introduction to sketching mammals of the world that I'll mention a little bit later, but there's all these types of, um, lifestyles that you can have, and they really relate to, um, that they influence how you're gonna look, what your body's gonna look like. So there's runners and jumpers like kangaroo rats and gerboas, diggers and crawlers like ground squirrels, guinea pigs, hamsters, the climbers like tree squirrels we're drawing today and porcupines. There's gliders like the flying squirrels, both new world and old world flying squirrels. And then a few of them even swim like beavers, muskrat and um, the nutria. So that's really going to affect their body. But um, most, most, uh, most of the rodent order are, are pretty small. A few of them get a little bit bigger, but a lot of them can pretty much uh, fit in the palm of a couple of your hands. And speaking of hands and fingers, um, so when you're drawing something, it is good to know um, how many fingers and toes they have in case case you do um, have a close-up, or even if you don't have a close-up view, you'll know how many to put. So this is a really cute uh, squirrel here. It looks like he's giving you a high five, but I'm using that image because you can clearly see that they have four toes on the front. And this is pretty much true for all rodents. Um, not all mammals, because a lot of mammals like us have five toes on front, but they have four toes or, well, fingers, I guess we would call them, four fingers um, on their forelimbs and then five on their back limbs. And often you can't see them. Sometimes you can just see the, the, the middle three, like in this picture and in this picture, but it's good to know that's how many they have. Okay. And then um, their tails really relate to their lifestyle as well. Like I mentioned earlier, whether they're um, a, a swimmer, like a beaver that has a big flat tail. Uh, once I was swimming in a big river in Montana and um, there was a dog, like a golden retriever swimming around in the same uh, area. And this beaver came up and uh, slapped his tail uh, to warn the uh, uh, dog not to come any quick closer. So they use that tail for balance and for communication. Uh, and then other things like kangaroo rats might have a super long tail to help them jump. Uh, and, and like this guy, the ger gerboa has a really long tail. Um, now, sometimes they're furry and sometimes they're unfurred, like our little uh, pet rat and pet mouse. And a lot of people don't like pet rats because they, they, they think this tail is kind of uh, ugly, but serves an important purpose. And here you can also see very easily the number of toes. Um, and you can actually see on this pet rat, there's a little tiny nubbin that's kind of the... Um, um, the uh, a thumb that's uh, gotten really small. So, you know, if you had a pet rat like I do, you could feel that little bump. But in general, they just have four longer fingers and then five toes in back. And then the arboreal ones like uh, porcupines, um, some of them are prehensile, which means they can wrap around um, a tree trunk to help hold them, just like some pangolins and lots of marsupials that we talked about last month, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So anyway, so we are here to sketch. We're here to draw. We're going to do some live sketching practice. Okay. And so uh, tell me in the chat box if anybody's ever practiced, uh, you know, been out in the field, either in your backyard sketching squirrels or, um, you know, on a trip or vacation sketching something in the field. Tell me. So um, many of you have um, already seen these kinds of uh, things. This comes from my courses, kind of my six steps to sketching success is looking at blocking in the main shapes, 
looking at the negative shapes, looking at the angles, looking at the alignments of various structures and the relative proportions of one structure to another, and then the flow lines. And uh, some other things to think about when you're uh, field sketching or doing quick gesture sketching uh, is to observe before starting. So it's really good, you know, like a squirrel. You might have a squirrel that comes to um, your backyard or is stealing nuts from your bird feeder every day. You know, really spend some time to observe them before you start sketching and that'll really help. Stay super light and loose. Keep your pencil moving, so don't get become a procrastinating perfectionist. Just move that pencil. Avoid erasing until the very end, until you have a bunch of marks down, and then you can erase. Uh, do a lot of what we call ground truthing in biology. I used to work as a field biologist, and we had this term called ground truthing, which basically means that you're looking at your um, subject um, almost more than you're looking at your paper. So like you um, you look at the subject's head and then you sketch the head. You look at the limb and you sketch the limb. You look at the body and you sketch the body and you're back and forth. So you're always drawing from uh, direct observation and not from memory or imagination, which is fun, but it's not what we do here. Okay. And then um, the most important part is enjoy the process of learning because it can be a little bit intimidating to be drawing, especially drawing out in the field. But um, every moment you spend looking at something is going to help you learn about it. And that's how really I first got into sketching, especially in college when I was studying biology and we had to learn so many different um, structures under the microscope and bones and muscles and identifying various species of birds from, you know, stuffed skins and dissecting fetal pigs and all of that stuff. And the only way I learned all of it was to be really present in the moment and fill sketchbooks with all of those things with lots of color coded notes. And that really helped me. So um, I want you just to think about that in terms of, of sketching. And uh, another thing that'll really help you that I talk a lot about in my uh, courses, um, I'll tell you about later, is um, really understanding the skeletal structure underneath. So if you know um, what the skeleton looks like, you'll understand the form and uh, you'll have, be, have better drawings. So like I tried to choose um, two images that were kind of in the same pose and you can kind of uh, imagine um, that with the skeleton underneath the squirrel. Because lots of mammals, they've got lots of fur and they're kind of all rounded. It's not as easy to draw them as if you were looking at maybe an insect where it's really obvious where the joints are and where the parts are. A lot of things in the mammal are just covered with fur and it looks like a big lump and you don't quite know what's what. But if you understand the underlying skeletal structure, you'll know what to look for. Like here, um, here's the elbow of the squirrel. And right here, you can see that same elbow. And here's the knee. And here you can see that same knee. And uh, the squirrels always have a really arched back um, um, a very flexible back for running and jumping in trees and for um, sitting. They're always going to have this big arch. And so that's the arch of the vertebral column. So anyway, knowing that is good. And you can study that kind of thing by going to natural history museums and looking at mounted skeletons uh, like I've shown you before. Uh, let's see, a couple months ago, I was at the High Desert Museum here where I live in Bend, Oregon, and they have wonderful mounted skeletons of things like porcupines, which is a rodent, um, both the skeleton they have mounted as well as the live, uh, the, the uh, what do you call it, taxidermied uh, uh, um, porcupine. And they also have live porcupines there, which I showed you videos of a couple months ago, I believe. Okay, and so here's another image where you can see the skeleton and noticing um, things like the skull, the neck, um, the uh, pectoral girdle, as they call it, the uh, rib cage, the backbone and tail, and then the hips and uh, pelvic girdle and, and rear legs. And you can see all of that here too. So hopefully um, thinking about that will help you. Okay. 
So, um, so when we're sketching in the field, I'd like you to first to just think about blocking everything in with these really simple shapes, not getting lost in the weeds. So here's just a quick um, picture that I started. And here's another example. These are all uh, 60 second sketches. Now these are from um, photographs that are in this slideshow later on, but I did just um, make myself practice <laughs> going just 60 seconds each. And um, you can kind of see that as I went, this was my first one, and I kind of got more confident and, and bold uh, by this one. And then I practiced sketching these uh, skeletons too. So the more you practice, the better you're going to get at um, both your hand-eye coordination and really imagining that skeletal structure under all the, the lumps and bumps of the live organism. Okay, and so first we're going to sketch this variegated squirrel, and I'm going to put him here. Um, I've spent a lot of time in uh, Honduras and all over the Central America, actually. And this, um, let me see, how do I get it larger? Wait a minute, got to get it larger. Oh, there we go. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, um, so yeah, um, Honduras is a beautiful um, country, and it's got this uh, Pico Benito National Park uh, that I was in, and my friend filmed this. And this really cute squirrel is called a variegated squirrel, meaning that they're all different various colors. They can be reds and browns, and it's eating a hibiscus flower. Isn't that cute? So anyway, I want you to pretend that you're out in the field and we're just going to block in those basic structures. Now, this is a really good uh, image to start with because this squirrel doesn't move much. Only basically his hands and his mouth are moving. So it's pretty easy to get your, um, your basic shapes. Okay. So wait, let's start in the beginning here. He's eating this really cute hibiscus flower. Okay. Ready? Who's ready to start sketching? And again, I suggest you, you start with a um, you start with a kind of a dull pencil like this. Now, if you don't if you, if you don't have a dull pencil, that's okay. But if it's a little bit dull, that will keep you from being too exact, and it'll help you just to get those big shapes of the triangular skull and the circular tail and that kind of thing. Okay, so. And some of you may have sketched this already with me before when we did the moving mammals, but it's always good practice. Okay, ready, set, go. <laughs> okay, isn't that cute? I will put a link to that in the chat box in case you want to watch that video again to practice. Okay, next, let me see, where are we next here? Oh, yeah. So this is um, my rat Pringles, and she's eating a carrot. <laughs> okay, so kind of in the same position. Uh, you can see those 
really big, cute ears, those big eyes, those uh, little, um, the whiskers and the little hands. Okay, so let's just try this. Okay. Okay, wait. Okay, now I have one more. Let's see. Let me find it here. And um, I didn't have a link to that one for Pringles for you, but I will put a link in to this next page. This is this is um, the Wikipedia page all about red squirrels, which are the ones we're drawing today. And it does have a, um, a couple really cute videos. Okay, so let's Let's see if we can get that bigger. Um, there we go. Okay. One more. Here we go. So that same posture, kind of the triangular head, the neck, the arched back. Oops. He ran off already. Oh, I think he, does he come back? Oh, wait, here he is again. And you can see the elbows. Let's start again. Okay. So that was a super quick sketch. And then there are a couple others here. So it's really great to practice. Practice. We're lucky there are so many videos online to practice from. That triangular head, you can see the hands and the elbows. You can see the knees, the arched back, the big fluffy tail. This is the Eurasian red squirrel we're going to be talking about later. Oh, there's some sound to it. Sorry, here we go. So also tell me in the chat box if you have any rodents in your backyard like squirrels and what species if you know them. Squirrels or ground squirrels or chipmunks. And if you ever tried to sketch them, like uh, Jean has tried to sketch a favorite squirrel that visits um, her yard. You know, mammals don't stay still for very long, and that's why it's really good practice to sketch from these uh, videos to get used to sketching really light and loose gesture sketches. Okay. 
All righty, so we can get rid of that. Okay, where are we now? Okay, yeah, so let's um, now uh, go back to the slideshow after you've had a little sketching practice. Um, yeah, oh, Susan says red squirrels, gray squirrels, chipmunks, great. Okay, and wood rats. Yeah, we'll talk about wood rats in a minute. Okay, good. So um, rodents fulfill a lot of ecological roles in the environment. So they're prey for many species, like this beautiful American kestrel that has caught some sort of a, a meadow mouse. Uh, they're ecosystem engineers, like beavers, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, they're important in aerating the soil, uh, even in pollination. Uh, and they disperse seeds and, and fungal spores uh, throughout the forests. And they help control weeds and insect populations. So where do they live? Rodents, rodents live all over the world. They are the most successful um, group of mammals. They live in all habitats and all continents except for Antarctica. And uh, it's because, you know, they have a small body size and they can adapt to a lot of different environments. They have a really uh, quick reproduction rate. So it's easy for them to uh, quickly evolve to um, handle different types of uh, environments and climates. And so speaking of world habitats, uh, next Monday, I'm going to be interviewing a colleague of mine, and I'm going to give you a link to that, and I'll send people links to that later on. Um, I'm going to put a link to that in the chat box right now. That's a, a free uh, presentation I'm doing uh, with Ian Campbell, who just wrote a book called Habitats of the World, which I happen to have illustrated the cover of. <laughs> but I'm also uh, a colleague of his. He uh, owns a birdwatching tour company and he travels all over the world and he's taken a lot of the photos and he and his um a uh, team of uh, biologists and photographers have created just this amazing book. So um, that's a free uh, conversation next Monday at, it's in the afternoon because he's in Australia. So it's at 3 p.m. Uh, Monday, 3 p.m. my time, which is a Pacific time on the West Coast of the United States. So I invite you to check that out, speaking of world habitats. <laughs> so anyway, rodents live all over the world. And so we'll just uh, mention some um, in different parts of the world. Now, in North America, we have a whole bunch of them, <laughs> like these cute little porcupines that live in trees. I've been lucky to see porcupines um, in the wild. Um, and, oh, welcome, Ilana. Hi, thanks for joining. Make sure you uh, watch the replay so you can learn some more about the basic characteristics we went over. But anyway, here, these are some of the spines of a porcupine. Now, this is from a tropical uh, species. I think these, um, this is a species in Africa or Asia, and the porcupines get really big there. <laughs> so anyway, that's what those are. So lots of different kinds of uh, rodents here in North America. And uh, one of my favorites is the beaver. They're really, really widespread. And uh, they used to be much more widespread all over the United States and Canada. Um, there is a European species as well. And they were um, hunted very heavily in um, the early days for their uh, pelts uh, because they have a very thick, warm fur to withstand the cold. So they were almost exterminated, but they are coming back. And uh, you can see that him sitting on this big tail and he's got webbed feet. So that's one of the characteristics of the aquatic uh, rodents. If you were going to be drawing them, you'd be wanting to notice those webbed feet. Um, but they're really important ecological engineers. And so um, they are going to be, of course, building dams like this one here. And that's super important in holding water back. So it's going to um, help to um, recharge the water table because if, if a stream just goes, you know, straight down the mountain without ever stopping, it's not going to help to recharge the underground, what we call the aquifers. And uh, they've even done research showing that uh, beavers helped to uh, mitigate some of the effects of the wildfires um, in the areas they lived because the, the forest was moister there because it, um, it had recharged the groundwater. 
Okay, and here's the cute little porcupine. Le they live in a lot of the same habitats and um, their species all over the world as well. A lot of different kinds of ground squirrels. Um, this one's called the golden mantled because he's got gold kind of on his mantle as it's called. And they kind of look like a chipmunk. Uh, Jacqueline had been talking about chipmunks. Um, and both chipmunks uh, and ground squirrels uh, do live on the ground mostly, uh, although they can climb trees. And um, they uh, kind of have pretty a very similar body style. Uh, but these ground squirrels have left less striping in their face or none at all. But you can see a lot of these rodents also have this white line around their eyes. Um, kind of like uh, lots of species of uh, birds, like warblers. Now, now here's another aquatic uh, North American um, um, rodent, the musk rat, and they have a flattened tail like a beaver, but instead of it being flattened uh, horizontally, is flattened vertically. So um, when they're swimming, they um, they swim back and forth with it. And we've got muskrats and beavers uh, right here on the Deschutes, the Deschutes River, where I live in central Oregon. And every night on my nightly walks, uh, I see the muskrats. Uh, and you can even see a little ghosting of his uh, foot there. So they're swimming with those webbed back feet. So kind of similar to beavers, but smaller with a different tail. Uh, another uh, big group of um, species uh, in the Amer North America are wood rats, also called pack rats. And uh, what's really special about them, someone had earlier mentioned them, is uh, they make these uh, middens. Sorry, it's a little bit small here. Let me see if it's a little bit bigger here. Yeah. So um, they make these middens. Uh, different species live all over North America. I think there's something like 20 species. Uh, and they build these up over the decades. And these can be up to 20,000 years old. So a family um, of pack rats will just keep building up and up and up and up. And what's really interesting about that is through the um, hundreds and thousands of years, they build up. It's almost like looking at... Um, the layers of sedimentary rock that um, paleontologists look at to study different um, animal species that lived at different periods of time. You can do that with middens too. And they look at, um, they look at like fossilized seeds and bones and leaves and compare the bottom to the top. Now this is a very small one, but they can get, uh, you know, like 10 feet high. And some of these middens go back, like I said, 20,000 years, especially in the American Southwest. So, um, paleontologists can look at the, how the climate has changed by looking at the different species of seeds. So in general, like in the American Southwest, West, they can see seeds from 20,000 years ago that would be of um, uh, grasses and flowers and trees that grew back then in a much moister environment. So they can really see climate change, both um, you know natural and um, uh, man-made climate change. So that's, I think, really fascinating fact about um, the uh, middens of pack rats. Okay, now um, another uh, kind of a ground dwelling uh, rodent uh, are prairie dogs. And uh, I talked earlier about the ecological role. Um, and these guys have a few important roles. One is as a prey species for the black footed ferret, which is critically endangered. It lives um, in uh, the central uh, prairies. Uh, and you may have uh, joined me earlier this year, I think in about uh, January, February, March, I did a whole series of workshops on endangered um, animals of the Americas. And that was one we talked about. Tell me in the chat box if you join me for that. But anyway, we talked a little bit about their prey. So um, the uh, prairie dog 
uh, is super important prey item. And if these guys have been hunted so heavily because they um, they they dig up the soil and make holes that supposedly um, horses and, and other uh, cattle and sheep can fall in and hurt themselves. So many of them have been um, over hunted and completely exterminated. So if you take away um, the prairie dog, you take away the ability of the black footed ferret to feed itself. So anyway, the prairie dog has two really important ecological functions. One as the main prey species for not only the fer um, the ferret, but nowadays also for other things like uh, coyotes and wolves and uh, bobcats and mountain lions. But also um, they are super important in aerating the soil. So all of the rodents that live underground, they are uh, making these burrows or in tunnel systems that might be miles long. So, you know, not only prairie dogs do that, but um, uh, voles do that, uh, which are is another kind of a rodent. Now, moles and shrews do also, but those are not rodents. Moles and shrews are called insectivores. Um, so they're not a rodent, but they do the same thing of aerating the soil, even same as an earthworm. So they're going to be mixing up the nutrients in the soil and making it less compacted and making it easier for plants to grow. Okay, uh, here's another cute little squirrel. I think this was the eastern gray squirrel that my friend Sam uh, took this photo of. Um, and again, you see this um, really easy for you to kind of imagine uh, once we've seen that skeleton to imagine the um, cranium and the elbow here and the hips and the arched uh, vertebral column and the tail. Here's another really cute one. Oh, I forgot who this guy is. Oh, I think this uh, I think this is in Sri Lanka. He leads tours uh, over there. Uh, but anyway, you can see all the time these these little squirrels and chipmunks are in this very characteristic pose. So it's pretty easy to um, practice drawing them like we will today pretty soon. Okay, deer mice, super cute with a really long tail. Okay, then moving south to Central and South America, um, the largest rodent in the world is the capybara, and they live in South America. It's, of course, hard to tell um, how big they are from this picture, but I think they get to be like 100 pounds or something. And here's a really sweet picture of their um, litter of uh, pups. Oh, Mary Ellen, that's an interesting fact that burrowing owls live in burrows that are excavated by prairie dogs. Yeah, lots of animals are symbiotic like that. Yeah, so uh, just like many squirrels, tree squirrels live in um, holes that are created by woodpeckers because <laughs> they both live in conifer and oak woodland forests. So some other ones um, are the agoutis, pacas, guinea pigs, nutrias, and chinchillas. Uh, and this is an agouti I saw at a lodge in Central America. So he's um, he's in the lawn there near this um, sculpture <laughs> and he's eating. Uh, these guys are really important prey items for all of the cat species that live in Central America. So in Central America, you have um, mountain lion, you have um, the, uh, what's it called? Uh, the jaggerundi, the margay, the ocelot. Uh, and the um, panthers. Okay, and here's another cute picture of them. They um, they have this really characteristic little tiny, tiny button-like tail. So someone was asking earlier about tails. So, you know, tails um, are, you know, really variable depending, again, on the, the habitat and the lifestyle. So these guys aren't trying to climb trees or balance like tree squirrels, so they don't need much of a tail. In fact, a tail might be a hindrance to them because it might make it easier for a predator like one of those ocelots to catch them while they're running away. But in this picture, you can see this really characteristic face that all the rodents have, this really squared off jaw, and they kind of like have an underbite. So this is an, uh, an angle here that's uh, kind of different than other groups of mammals, like the families of dogs or cats or other things we've talked about before in our mammal course. 
And remember, it's got a really deep, it's got a really deep um, jaw because again, they've got those really big, long incisors that are built for chewing. So it's going to be have a really thick, you know, squared off head and it's going to have this underbite. So this angle here. Okay. I hope you can see that. All righty. Um, and then chinchillas. Does anybody um, know anyone that's ever had a chinchilla as a pet? <laughs> so a lot of these species we're talking about today have been kept as pets. But remember that, you know, all pets originate uh, in the wild and the chinchillas uh, from South America. And they like to take these dust baths. And so if you have a pet chinchilla, you would buy this, this dust and let them bathe in it. And that's how they clean themselves. Another one in South America is the guinea pig. And um, this is a really super cute one that has been bred to have these cute colors, but uh, in nature, they're not so colorful. Now, um, the guinea pig, like a lot of rodents, have been uh, eaten for food um, by native peoples for thousands of years. And when I went to Peru, um, there were restaurants uh, where they were actually raising the guinea pigs in the back and you could have roast guinea pig, which I did not have, um, but it ha is been a very important uh, natural food source for um, native cultures for thousands of years. Yes, yeah, Cece, right? They're called cooies, right? Is that how you pronounce that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that on the menu. <laughs> Okay, then moving over to um, Europe and Asia and Africa, we call it Eurasia. So a lot of species over there. Now, one of them is the cute mole rat. And you might have joined me for my mole rat uh, workshop last year. And a few of them are also uh, pets like gerbils, hamsters. We've got porcupines and rats and mice over there that are what we call the old world um, groups. The jumping derboa or jerboa, yeah, deer mice, all that kind, door mice, and old world flying squirrels. Okay, and um, now oh, this, sorry, this uh, slide is a little bit out of uh, the area, but a lot of the mouse like rodents do live in uh, Eurasia and they comprise about 25% of all rodents. So thinking of rats and mice. And I first started um, really loving uh, rats when I worked with uh, this researcher, her name's Kelly Lambert. And uh, I did some graphic design and website design work for her. And she studies um, rats as, as models for human behavior. And it's very interesting research. And um, uh, I'm going to copy and paste this so you can learn more because she has really interesting research online and, uh, and books as well. And so she's done these uh, research projects. <laughs> she's got these cute little cartoons that um, her, one of her um, students drew talking about how um, if you put a rat in a, a healthier uh, environment versus an unhealthy, boring environment that actually changes their brain. And it shows them in, in different environments where there's lots of things to play with. <laughs> and then they also talk about stress, like if they cope with stress. Um, and um, the parent parenting, all kinds of really fascinating research. Um, she's done. And so that's how I first got into um, them. And um, rats that are um, uh, spoiled are not as healthy as rats that um, live a healthier environment in a healthier environment where um, food uh, is not as easy to get. So anyway, I really highly recommend you check out that link to her website. Really fascinating research. And so as you may know, I, I do love rats, partly because of working with um, Dr. Lambert. Uh, I think it's been about 12 years ago that I started working with her and uh, I got my own pet rats. And so they're really intelligent and entertaining pets. So tell me in the chat box if any of you have ever had pet rats. And there's a great book called um, Misunderstood, Why the Humble Rat May Be Your Best Pet Ever. And I have that book. So it's kind of fun 
They are a lot different than mice. Um, so I would suggest if you were going to get a pet for yourself or for, um, uh, you know, your kids or grandkids, it would be a rat and not a mouse. Um, so anyway, the pet rat is the species called the brown rat um, or Rattus norvegicus, and that is from Europe. That's why we're um, talking about this now in this uh, in this little section on uh, Eurasian species. Now, the other um, main rat that's been really familiar with people through the ages is the black rat or Rattus rattus. And they were the vector of the bubonic plague that was started in, oh, what was it, like the 1100s and went through the medieval period and the dark ages. And um, that plague killed up to uh, something like a half of, of Europe's population, depending on what, um, what era and what uh, country you were in. So, um, but we don't want to blame the black rat because um, the black, it, it's not him that was carrying it. Um, the black rat was infested with a flea and a flea was infested with a bacteria. And it's the bacteria that actually causes um, the bubonic plague. <laughs> so they didn't mean to be doing that. <laughs> so we don't want to hate them for that, but um, they are pretty famous for that. Anyway, moving on. Um, now, moving south from uh, Europe down to uh, Africa is the jerboa, and that um, is a, a kind of thing that looks a lot like our New World kangaroo rat, which I've also taught you about previously. So they have that lifestyle of being uh, what we call saltators or saltatorial, where they jump and they have these really long uh, legs and this really long tail to help give them balance and these giant ears to help them uh, listen for predators because they have a lot of predators like most, like most rodents, all kinds of uh, reptiles and birds of prey and other mammals too. Okay, and then uh, moving on to a few other things that have been kept as uh, pets, the Mongolian gerbil uh, and the, the pet Syrian hamster, <laughs> which is actually uh, endangered in its uh, native range. Okay, another really cool um, species in Africa is the um, giant pouched rat. Uh, now, this is a rat that's native to Africa, and it saves lives by detecting landmines and tuberculosis. It can actually be trained to smell those things out. And you can see this great picture um, uh, of this conservation organization is called um, a popo. And these guys are called um, hero rats because they, they're saving thousands of lives by being taught how to um, detect these things. So I really suggest you check out their website. I don't have a link to it um, live right now, but they're called apopo.org. Uh, and uh, it's, it takes years to uh, train these rats and you can see how big they are. And um, they're a little bit uh, maybe scarier than your pet rat um, looking, uh, but they, they're really intelligent. Okay, so that's a cool thing. Okay, now, um, since we've talked a little bit about members um, around the world, we're gonna get closer to the species we're sketching today. Um, in the squirrel family. So rodents have many, many families, and I've shown you examples of some of them before. So now we're going to focus on this Sciuridae family or the squirrels. And so actually next month, um, January 21st, is Squirrel Appreciation Day. And I might do another um, workshop, maybe on these cute ground squirrels next time, next month. We'll see. Okay, but anyway, so they comprise uh, several hundred species all over the world. Um, so there's Asian pygmy tree flying squirrels. And then there's the things that don't look so squirrely like marmots and ground squirrels. And this is a historic drawing um, of some flying squirrels. Okay, so in terms of ground squirrels, the marmot is one of them. Uh, there are both North American and Eurasian species of these guys. Um, if you've ever heard of Groundhog Day, uh, one of the species, um, that's what they are. Uh, they're also known as woodchucks uh, and marmots. And we have sp several species here in the Pacific Northwest. And they're really cute. 
Um, they live among the um, rocks, so they don't bur bur bury in the soil like prairie dogs and other rodents. They actually live in little caves in, in rock piles, big granite rock piles, or here where we live, um, uh, we live in the volcanic region, so they're um, in volcanic rocks. Now, we actually have a family of these guys right downtown near me, near the river, uh, where there's a really big pile. I think it was built for um, uh, housing development, but it's about 30 feet high. And it's all of these big giant rocks that are about a foot or two foot in diameter. And there's a lawn next to it. And you can see these guys. Now, these guys um, hibernate. So most of them don't. Most rodents don't because they really need to, um, they have a high metabolism for their small body. But these guys are pretty big. They're kind of as big as a, I don't know, a basset hound or something or a big cat. Um, so they eat, eat, eat continuously from something like, uh, you know, June to September, depending on the weather. And then they go into their... Um, their dens and you don't see them again. They hibernate all winter. So around here um, where I live in Oregon, we always know that it's springtime and we always are excited to look forward to spring when you see the first marmots grazing on the lawn downtown. <laughs> oh, Christine. Yeah, you have one that's uh, burrowed its cave under your front step. <laughs> Funny. Okay, another one of my favorite um, local species is the Douglas squirrel, also called the chicory. Um, and these, these guys make a, a sound kind of like, um, well, yeah, a lot of these guys make a lot of funny sounds. So uh, marmots do a little whistling sound, uh, like uh, that is a warning sound. And the chicories, they have a really um, loud sound. And when they're doing it, their tail is wagging. So they'll go like, tick, tick, tick. And every time they make the little sound, the tail goes, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> it's really funny. And these guys are always um, eating big pine, pine cones. They can sometimes drop them on your head or on your car. So you have to be kind of careful about where you park if you're parked under a big old pine tree where these guys live. Uh, and so they're opening these up to get the super nutritious seeds inside. Like if you've ever had a pine nut, um, a commercial pine nut from the store, like they make uh, pesto out of, that's the same idea is every species of, of pine in the world makes these really nutritious seeds. Okay. Okay. A few more. The gray squirrel, that's a Western. There's Western and Eastern gray squirrels. Uh, and, uh, these are guys are really cute and active. This is a picture I took. So that's why it's a little bit blurry. And here's one of them eating. And again, really characteristic pose. So if you can get, um, at least some practice drawing them in this pose, that's what they're going to look like 90% of the time when you see them in the field. Okay. Now, um, uh, chipmunks are another really big group um, of rodents, just like we said how there are dozens of pack rat species. There are dozens of chipmunk species, um, over 23 species in North America. Now, Jacqueline had been asking about the difference between ground squirrels and chipmunks. Um, and chipmunks are kind of a, a type of ground squirrel living on the ground. But you can see all of their striping patterns. So that's how you can tell these are different from other ground squirrels like the um, Belding's ground squirrel. Um, and they live in a little different habitats. So chipmunks often will be living more in the forest and eating uh, conifers and fruits and things uh, and nuts and seeds. Whereas the ground squirrels are often more in a more open environment, kind of more prairie and um, you know, oak woodlands. Okay. So anyway, the chipmunks are also smaller. Uh, you know, they would fit in the palm of your hand and they've got stripes through their eyes, just like a lot of birds do, and then stripes down their back. And so a lot of times it's pretty hard to tell the difference to identify the different species of chipmunk in your area. Partly it has to do with the, um, if you're in a certain geographic area, you know what species it is. Like we have least chipmunks here and yellow pine chipmunks in California, but there's a lot more of them too. Yeah, Milana says they're really cute. 
Oh, and Maria. Um, oh, you're in Scotland. They push out the red squirrel. Yeah, we're going to mention that in a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, any species that that's living in the wrong place where they don't belong is going to wreak havoc. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, chipmunks. Okay, moving on. Now we're uh, moving on to Asia, where some of my favorite species are. So the giant red flying squirrel is, I believe, the largest squirrel in the world, and it lives in Borneo. So I'm just going to orient you here because that's an important uh, area for squirrel diversity. Uh, Borneo is the world center of diversity for squirrel species. So out of the almost 300 species of squirrels, 36 of them are in the island of Borneo, which is divided up between uh, three countries, um, Malaysia and Indonesia and um, very tiny Brunei. So if you can, um, you can see, you know, it's kind of south of Thailand and uh, let's see, Australia would be kind of over here. New Guinea would be kind of here. And so anyway, this is the third largest island in the world. And so this is the giant red flying squirrel. And you can see the, um, the, the membrane here that is linking their forearms and their rear arms together to help them glide. They don't really fly. So the only mammal that truly flies are bats. And you may have joined me for one of my many bat sketching workshops because I love bats. <laughs> but anyway, so they, they glide or um, it's called parachuting also. And that's evolved in three very different mammal groups. It's evolved in the flying squirrels like we're talking about today. It's evolved in sugar gliders which are a type of marsupial, which we've talked about um, and done work sketching workshops several times in the past. And then it's in this other kind of mammal, one of my favorite mammals in the world, the Kalugo, also known as the flying lemur, although they're not, they're not related to primates at all. They're in their own order. And here it is flying. And this thing that's um, right there is the baby holding on. And I've actually seen... Um, I've actually seen these guys. They also live in Borneo and I've seen them. They wake up at night because all flying squirrels are nocturnal um, and they uh, wake up at night. They climb up to the top of a tree just like these other guys do. And then they launch themselves off so that they can um, fly to the next tree. And then they do it again. They climb up the next tree and launch and they can go all through the forest. Now, of course, if the forests have been logged and the trees are too far away from each other for them to easily fly from tree to tree, well, all three of these groups of mammals are really gonna have a hard time um, surviving. Anyway, so here's another picture. Um, you can see the flying squirrel when they're perched here, they look different than your normal squirrel that we were looking at previously because they have this kind of lump here. And that is the big fold of skin that unites the, um, the arms and the legs and that, that allows them to glide. Now, I was super lucky a few years ago to go to the island of Borneo and it's super, super lush. <laughs> um, and so there are many, many species, like I said, um, and 14 of the species are endemic. So meaning they only live on the island of Borneo and they live in these giant dipto, dipto, diptocarp forests, which is a type of um, uh, flowering fruiting tree. And here I am at the base of the tree looking up at it. And you can just see this amazing habitat. And right here is a terrible photo, but it's hard to get photos of these guys because they're nocturnal. And so right here, this is um, one of the flying um, squirrels waking up in the evening and getting ready to jump off of the limb. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty hard to see them, but at about dawn, um, dusk, at about dusk, about 6 p.m., you can look up at these trees and you'll see them coming out of their um, little crevices, which again, many of them have been created by things like woodpeckers and hornbills. Um, and they're going to jump um, out to the next tree. Okay. All righty. So finally, we're getting ready to um, learn about our focus species, the Eurasian red tree squirrel or um, Sirius um, vulgaris. Um, vulgaris just kind of means like common. That's a G, uh, Greek name. 
or Latin that is. Okay, so here we go. Now, I know some of you guys are watching from Europe. Um, so tell me in the chat box if you live in Europe, where you live, and if you've seen the red tree squirrel. So they live in a lot of different habitats. They're very widely dispersed. Um, so, you know, they can eat a lot of different foods, uh, but basically different um, fruits and, and nuts from various conifer trees and oak trees. They live in all these different habitats. So a lot of times when we're thinking about a habitat, we might think, oh, a conifer forest or, you know, an oak woodland. But um, habitats are really um, divided up more finely than that. And I'm going to teach you about that more um, when I do the uh, workshop next week with the author of the Habitats, the World book. Uh, but here are just some of the names, um, the more scientific names for all the habitats they live in, depending on where they are. So up north here, our spruce is the spruce fir taiga that's right at the edge, um, you know, of the tundra, whereas down farther south, um, you know, in Spain and Italy, they're more in the Mediterranean oak forests, but they're always in some kind of oak or conifer forest. Um, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, there are, Milana, there are um, other species of tree squirrels um, in Iowa too. Yes but not the one we're drawing today. Uh, Maria, you live on a small island in Scotland. No squirrels. Yeah, right. Well, um, so a lot, of, a lot of smaller mammals have not been able to make it to various islands, but that is, is an interesting thing you br bring up that many islands are not um, adapted. The, the fauna is not adapted to deal with non-native animals. And so, you know, many species uh, like um, rats, <laughs> various rats have been taken taken around the world by accident in the cargo holds of ships and even planes um, that land on islands and they have devastated the native fauna that were just not used to that kind of a predator. So rodents um, have both good and bad uh, influences on the environment. Okay, so anyway, here, like I said, the habitats are really variable. Um, so more from, you know, larches and oaks and beaches, you know, to kind of a mixed conifer forest like um, spruce and fir and pine. Okay, and so um, like I said, um, this is the book that I'll be talking about more next Monday, the 13th. We're going to be interviewing Ian Campbell, and he's going to be talking about some of his favorite and most endangered habitats of the world. So I suggest you um, check that out. And, uh, oh, no, that's not a good link. Okay, anyway, yeah. Okay, let's keep going. So those are some squirrels. Let's see. Let's keep going. We're getting behind. All righty. So, so we're talking about the Eurasian red squirrel, the tree squirrel, and it is the national mammal of Denmark. Its image um, is um, uh, frequent. Sorry, spelling error there. Frequent many coats of arms. Uh, you know, they're very common in the heraldry of European uh, families. Uh, in Norse mythology, there's a squirrel um, that spreads gossip because you can imagine how a squirrel can move so quickly from tree to tree and all through the forest that you can imagine how they might have imagined um, the Norsemen that they're spreading a gossip from tree to tree. Uh, they've been featured in a Swedish children's song um, that's still sung today from the 1800s. Uh, of course, they've been hunted for food and for their pelts, just like other rodents, like beavers and otters. Well, wait, no, otters aren't a rodent. But anyway, since antiquity and their pelts were once used in Finland as currency. Now. Oh, where did that other book go? So one of my favorite authors uh, when I was a kid was Beatrix Potter. Tell me in the chat box if you've read any of the books by Beatrice Potter. So um, her book, The Story, the Tale of Squirrel Nutkin was uh, based on the European uh, Eurasian red squirrel. And what I loved about her is she really tried to do really realistic illustrations, which um, was not common in those days. 
Now, of course, some of her books had animals that had clothes on, but they were still pretty anatomically correct. So she had a lot of training in biology and she did a lot, many um, biological illustrations. So this was really fun. And there are some wonderful new books about Beatrix Potter. I read two of them this um, last summer and her life was just super fascinating. Another uh, one by Beatrix Potter on a rodent is The Tale of Two Bad Mice. Now, these books I've had since I was a little kid. So these are some of the um, almost original books. <laughs> she lived a uh, long time ago in the early 1900s. And this book was written in, um, no, I can't read it. But anyway, the illustrations are super realistic. And that's what I really loved about her. Now in these books, they had clothes on, but you can still see she tried really hard to be accurate with the ears and the eyes and a little snout and that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, Susan likes her, Beth, Christine. Yeah. Okay. What else? Um, Oh, yeah. I'd like to, you know, show you examples, of course, of art through the ages. I've been showing you a few of those. And here's a really beautiful one from a book called British Mammals in 1920. And here it, um, the squirrel is eating. Uh, it, I can't quite tell what this is in the background. This sort of looks like mushrooms. But um, so, you know, and maybe even some chestnuts right there. But they eat a wide variety of foods, um, you know, not only, you know, nuts and acorns, um, but fruits and a little bit of insects, uh, but also mushrooms as well. And like I mentioned earlier on in the ecological role of uh, rodents, that many squirrels do eat mushrooms. You may have been hiking in the forest and seen some mushrooms that were dig up, dug up and bitten into. So they will um, take those mushrooms and they'll um, take them up to their stores and keep them for part of the winter. And as they're moving those, the mushrooms are able to release their spores into a wider area because they might, um, you know, carry them from tree to tree to tree. So uh, squirrels, you know, not only completely eat um, mushrooms and seeds and fruits, but they're going to be spreading those seeds and um, spores throughout the forest and helping to keep it more diverse. Okay, here we are. Another picture of a squirrel. Got to keep moving on. We're going to run out of time here. So here he is eating in a conifer forest. Here he is at a food bowl. And you can see those claws really easily. Here's the one we're going to be sketching. So these guys have really long hairs uh, on their ears, which is uh, kind of diagnostic. They do come in different colors. So here's one that's kind of more gray. So they're a different color in the summer versus the winter. And here's some more historic illustrations of some various species of squirrels. So the tree squirrels in general are going to have these bigger tails so that they're able to balance because they can move those tails up and down, kind of have they have here um, and back and forth to help them balance on, on things that are swinging. I don't know, once or twice, I've even seen a squirrel trying to balance on a utility line and you can see their, their um whipping their tail back and forth really quickly to kind of counterbalance their weight. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that before, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, Jacqueline says they look like they have a mohawk hairstyle. Uh, and here's one jumping so they, can, they can't they can glide because they don't have the gliding membrane, but they certainly can jump a long ways. And again, they're going to use that long tail to help them. Now, this, I think this isn't the red squirrel. This is somebody else. But anyway, showing a jumping squirrel. <laughs> but that's not a pose you're generally going to see or sketch. So it's good to practice sketching them in the most common pose you're going to see them in. And if I'm going to be visiting a new habitat, I try to... Um, practice sketching from photographs and like YouTube videos like I showed you earlier so that I can get used to the kind of animals that are going to be at the location I'm going to visit. 
Now, um, they make nests uh, in the trees, um, uh, both kind of a roosting nest and a nest to have their babies in. Um, sometimes they will roost in old woodpecker holes as well, but they also make nests where they can rest. And just like our um, squirrels here, sometimes they'll tear bark off the sides of the trees. Like where I live in, we uh, the habitat I live in, we have juniper trees and they have a really um, kind of a fibrous bark like this that's really easy to strip off. And they use that to line their nests and have their really cute little babies. And here's a picture I took in my neighborhood for you just this morning of a nest. Um, and so this is a bunch of uh, leaves that they have put together. Um, and it's easier to see them, of course, in the winter when all the other leaves have fallen. So tell me in the chat box, who has seen this before? Um, now, I photographed this through by my binoculars. So that's why it's circular here. <laughs> okay. And again, just another cute image. Now you can always watch the replay and you can always freeze um, the replay and practice sketching just like I did with those one minute sketches. You can put a timer on and because, you know, very rarely are you going to have a squirrel spending more than a minute sitting somewhere. Often they'll try to take their uh, quarry like this, um, this acorn up and get hide somewhere, but sometimes they'll, they'll stay. Okay. Oh, let's see. We did that already. Okay. Alrighty. So this is the one we're going to draw in just a moment. And so I want you to be noticing some of those things I mentioned before. So we've got our basic shapes. Okay. So we kind of have triangular ears, um, a triangular head, circular eye. We've got uh, the shoulder with the two um, hands together. We've got the arched back and the really fluffy tail. We've got the hips here with the, um, the knee right here and the elbow is back here. And then we have the feet. Okay. Um, so just noticing that also noticing, you know, the angles of things, alignments, negative shapes. So for example, the negative shape of kind of the oval between the two ears. Uh, what else? Like the triangle between the foot and the uh, um, hind limb there. So these tiny um, little areas that can help you. Christine P has a nest. Yes. Okay. Yeah. A lot of times they are there for a few years unless there's a big storm that um, makes them go away. <laughs> Okay. And then again, as we're drawing, just trying to imagine what the animal looks like inside. Like again, rodents are always going to have this really thick um, jaw area, really squared off jaw with the underbite because the lower incisor goes inside the upper. And then again, just imagining we've got um, our elbows, our knees, uh, the big flat foot. They're called plantigrade. We talk about that in my sketching course. And speaking of my sketching course, <laughs> so um, today's workshop is actually part of a year long series um, in my course called Learning to Sketch the World's Mammals. And I gave you a link to that up above. And I'm going to put a link um, right here again in the chat box for 20% off um, today. You can get that course. And so we sketched lots of mammals. I launched this course of, um, this summer and it was super fun to do. And so um, it also includes workshops on other rodents like the kangaroo rat and um, the mole rat. And we did quite a more detailed drawing with the mole rat. <laughs> and it also um, includes upcoming workshops. So next month, we're going to do um, the platypus and echidna and all these other guys. And um, oh, yeah, and there's another previous workshop and a closely related member. Um, it's a you know the rabbit group, uh, the pikas, which um, live in kind of some of the similar habitats as squirrels. Um, they're closely related, but they're in a different order, the rabbit order, which includes rabbits and pikas. 
Okay. And then it also has foundational workshops on drawing different parts. And again, if you're actually already in this mammal course, don't forget to check those out. If you didn't join us live, um, there's foundational things on sketching heads and faces, skeletons, muscles, limbs, hands, and feet, how to sketch moving mammals and all of that. Okay, so let's start sketching our tree squirrel. We got just enough time. I've gotten a little bit behind here. So we're going just in time because this is going to basically take up the rest of our time. Okay, who is ready to sketch our tree squirrel? And um, you can you can use any medium you want, but I'm going to use uh, a, a pencil, a colored pencil. One reason I like to do that is to make myself practice not erasing. So we're not erasing. <laughs> At least I'm not in this demonstration. And that's just to help you get over um, perfectionism um, and just to start really light and loose um, so you don't have to try to erase. And even if you make a mistake, just draw right over it a little bit darker. Okay. So if you did the warm ups uh, earlier um, today, then hopefully that will help you to have warmed up for this. Okay, let's get started. So I'm, I'm first going to demonstrate with a super light pencil. I don't even know if you can see this line, but um, it helps me get started. So I don't feel like I have to erase anything. And again, no matter what kind of medium you have, you can just draw very lightly, but I'm just spending a, a few moments drawing these basic shapes of the ears and the head, the arched back. And don't worry, in a minute, I'll switch to the brown pencil. But sometimes it's good to just ghost draw um, with a pencil on top of your image just to get used to it. Okay, so now I'm switching here. <laughs> So now I'm going to kind of do the same thing kind of because I penciled in that outline that obviously you can't see right now, but um, we're going to start really light and loose with just those basic um, geometric shape. And then we'll go back to each of these parts in detail and I'll give you a close ups of like the head to deal with later. So right now I just want you to draw as lightly as you possibly can just penciling in the triangles and circles, and we'll firm these up later. Little oval for the snout, double checking my proportions. So I try to get the, the width and the heights first. Ground truthing my widths and heights. Now I'm gonna add the neck. And just that arched back, again, staying super light, double checking kind of my basic width and looking at the edges of the paper. We're coming, doing this arched back and then the arched rump coming down the other side from the neck and the breast, chest, back. Okay, as usual, we go back over all of this, but I'm just penciling in kind of where the drawing is gonna be and I'm do going the very lightest I possibly can. In fact, if I wasn't drawing this to demonstrate for you, I'd be drawing even a lot lighter like the first yellow pencil I used. I'm imagining here where the shoulder is and um, kind of the paddle of the hand there, where it lines up with the uh, kind of the rest of the body, doing those alignment ideas. We're not pushing at all. Now the, the, the hips and rump area, the knee is right there. It's right below the uh, wrist. You see, we're just staying really light and loose and just just those basic circles and triangles and squares first. 
And you see the feet come almost to the edge of the paper. Just kind of a triangle for the, the foot. Triangle for both legs there. Looking at my alignments, where my toes lined up. Double checking my length and then my width. Pretty close. He could be leaning over a little bit more, but he could also be sitting more upright. So that's close enough. Okay, now here's our close up of our head. So let's work on the head now for a few minutes. So we're going to try to get the details of the head. And if you've got a nice large monitor, like I always suggest people watch on, uh, you'll see the head a lot better than I did when I was sketching it live. So this ear kind of folds over in the front and comes down. And you can see the inside of the ear a bit. And then there's an arch on the forehead to the other ear, which you don't see the inside of because we just see the back of that ear. And the forehead is coming in front of it, so it's shorter than the squirrel's right ear. Now the snout here comes out just a little bit because he's kind of facing us three quarters. So it's not as long as it would be if he was facing away. Got the opening of his snout, opening of the mouth. And the two lips, two upper lips, and the lower, lower lip, which is part of the lower jaw. Placing the eye is really important. So we're ground truthing, kind of aligning where the eye is compared to that ear. So we're sort of looking at the horizontal and vertical alignments. Placing it where it is on the snout. Now, yeah, usually I wouldn't draw these lines quite as dark. But I'm doing it so that you can see. And you can see his other eye just a teensy bit. You can see the squirrel's left eye just a little bit. So I added that. And then I'm going to put it in alignment with the, the squirrel's larger right eye. And then there's a little triangle, just like in our eye, a little triangle that comes out that's lighter, that's the white of the eye. I'm just going to add a little shading right now and leaving a white area for the highlight. Although notice in this illustration, I mean, in this photograph, this squirrel is in a, in a studio. And so you see a, a kind of rectangular highlight that's not natural. It wouldn't look like that out in the field. Um, it would probably look a little bit more oval. So just for you to notice that. I'm just trying to erase those uh, placement lines, <laughs> get those out of the way. The eye does have a, this little circle around it, like you saw in the chipmunks. Some of them, it's just a lighter area. Now put a little bit more detail in that ear. Again, it's shadowed because you can see the inside of the squirrel's right ear. And then the, the fur of the forehead, it comes in front of the squirrel's left ear. Notice there's some dots I'm putting in for the whiskers, but I'm not adding the whiskers yet because I'm going to be doing some shadowing under that first, and I want those whiskers to be crisp. So I'll do that towards the end. And you see how I'm pressing a little bit harder. 
as I get a little bit more confident. So now we're going to go back to the rest of the body. The neck. Now the hairs on, on an animal's body uh, tend to get longer as they go from the head down towards the rump. So um, these ones are pretty short here and then they'll get kind of longer and curved. So I'm just doing these kind of short parallel lines. And then the rest of the rump and imagining the knee right there. And there's kind of two colors. There's the white I'm drawing now is actually his belly hairs are all white. Lots of rodents aren't colored on their bellies like my pet rats. <laughs> and now I'm sharpening a bit because we've done the placement. Yeah, I, I noticed that I definitely have my rodent a little bit more upright than the one in the photo, but that's okay. That's still anatomically correct. He still could be um, sitting more straight, so it doesn't matter. And then we're going to get the shoulder there. And the hands are, are kind of touching. And uh, on the squirrel's left, on the squirrel's right hand, you can't see the fingers. You can only see the palm of the hand and then going over towards the elbow, which is kind of hidden. But now that we have practiced and know it's back there, we can add some shadowing there. It's very subtle. Now the other hand, yeah, you just see a little bit of the knuckles right there. The other hand, you see more from the side. So you see three, you see three of the longer fingers pretty well, and then the kind of a thumb that's folded over. So you basically see the palm of the hand, which has fur on it. And then the pink part I'm drawing now is the three fingers. So I'm not trying to get too particular. I'm just drawing two lines so that we have three fingers. And then you can kind of see one of them is sort of folded in towards his belly. And maybe you see a little bit of that kind of thumb-like thing. And I'm adding that other thumb. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to go down to the feet. I didn't give you a close-up of the feet because I don't want you to get too lost in the weeds because, again, we're not trying to make a biological illustration. We're kind of going to pretend that we're seeing what we would see in the field. And so we're not going to generally be counting all the toes and drawing them exactly like we would in a photograph. So don't worry. If you can't see something well, um, just stay just light and loose and sort of symbolic. And again, the more you can study uh, animals in the field uh, or at a museum, sometimes zoos have like live uh, events where they have kind of the, uh, what do they call them? The animals that are... <laughs> the tamest that will um, be demonstrating what they do <laughs> to the audience. Ma sort of like mascot animals. So we do know that they have five toes, but you can't really see all of them. So I'm just kind of doing these zigzaggy things that just show that we've got some various toes. Now we're gonna add that tail and just keep it light and fluffy. And those lines are really skinny. So I, I think I sharpened my pencil a little bit there.
And uh, it would help if this paper weren't taped down. So I encourage you to move your paper however you need to, to make it more ergonomic for you to draw those arched lines. Because this is really awkward for me, the way it's taped down. Um, so just know that, that I encourage you to move your, your, your paper, your sketchbook around so that it's easier for you to uh, draw those lines. Okay, so that's the basic outline. Um, I, I could do a little bit more, but we're kind of running out of time. And I want to make sure if anybody wants to come up on the screen and ask any questions or share your sketches um, or ask any questions about squirrels or rodents or sketching or anything we've covered, um, the way you would do that is um, the way you would do that is you would get in the chat box and you would type in the word share and then I click on your name and then uh, the um, Crowdcast will um, see if you've got audio and video that works. And if you do, you'll come on screen and it usually works pretty well. <laughs> um, so does anybody want to come up before we go any farther? I, I don't know how much more time we have, but I did want to make sure to get at least the outline of the squirrel. Uh, for you there. So you could get going with that. Anybody want to come up? Well, I'll keep playing this then. And so I'm using this value scale. I'm going to start to do some shading here. And uh, I gave you that handout talking about the value scale. Oh, good. Let's have Milana come up because she knows how to share. And for those of you who are new, you might not know how that works. So I want to make sure to have Milana come up. And so I will click on her, her little um, icon there and see if she can share. And I'll keep... Uh... Oh, Carmen wants to share. That's wonderful. Good, good, good. Hi, Milana. Hello. Let's see what oh, that's gorgeous. Really good. Wow, you're getting so accurate. I really love that. That's really nice. Also, I want to show my cat. Well, we don't have that much time to share the cat. <laughs> the cat is in the Felid family, not the rodent family. I know. <laughs> It devours rodents. Oh, yes, it does. So we're going to invite Carmen up now since we're running out of time. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Milana. Thanks for... Oh, sorry. I cut you off, Milana, but we have to move on. <laughs> but thanks for demonstrating how other people can do that. So I did click on Carmen's name. I don't think Carmen has shared before. So I'm just continuing to add some shading here. We do uh, we do have to um, end at the two hour mark. Sorry, I did mean to go 90 minutes, but there are so many interesting things to share about rodents. <laughs> and I'll definitely do more workshops in the future on some of those other members of that order. But um, I just couldn't stop myself from uh, doing research like on the hero rats of Africa that uh, that can detect uh, tuberculosis and landmines. So yeah, anybody else who wants to share, you do have to get in the chat box. So I know you're here and type in the word share. And um, in the meantime, I'm just kind of showing how I'm using the side of my pencil. I'm using a more dull pencil. And um, yeah. Oh, and Grace wants to share. Right. And since, um, just a sec, I'm going to look over here. I'm going to look over here at, sorry, I'm looking in my, I'm going to share for some of you who are new copy. Um, 
I'm going to put a link in the chat box to my Facebook um, group. Hello, how are you? This is Adagio. Adagio, greetings. Thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have a sketch you want to share it with us? The school is fat. <laughs> well, that's good. This is a good time of year to be fat because they're going to have to save up for the winter time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have squirrels where you live? Yeah. Yeah? In the maple trees. In the maple trees? Yeah. Cool. Do you know what kind of squirrels? I don't know. No. <laughs> Your hat kind of looks like it has a squirrel ear on it. <laughs> yeah, that's really cute. Well, did you learn something fun about rodents and squirrels today? Good. And is Carmen your mother? Is that the name on the... Uh, yeah, okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing so much, Adagio. I hope to see you again in the future. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, and I'm click on Grace. So yeah, I was mentioning my um, Facebook group, and that's a private group um, where you can post your sketches. So um, hopefully you'll keep working on those like I am here. And yeah. Anybody else want to share? We do have about 15 more minutes. Let me show you here. This is my um, nature sketching challenge group. And this is where you can um, post your pictures. And it's where I um, add things. Uh, well, it's not scrolling for some reason. But anyway. Oh, there we go. Oh, is this Grace? Yes, it is. Hi, how are you? <laughs> uh, Oh, wow, fun. Yeah, oh, and yeah. now what was the That's color right. medium you used? Um, it was um, pastel. Oh, lovely. A chalk or oil? Um, chalk, I believe. Yeah, chalk. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. fun. I love That's him. Sketch, yeah. Oh, and the other one, too? Yeah. Great. Well, you can definitely spend uh, more time on those like I did in the video. I think I spent about 20 more minutes. Right. <laughs> so a lot yeah. of fur to, to draw. Exactly. And uh, do you have squirrels or other rodents in your neighborhood? Yes, I do. Lots of them. In fact, they eat my tulip bulbs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's a charcoal black squirrel that I'm very interested in in the park nearby. There's a few of them. I think there's a family there. Like oh, them. okay. They're not yeah. hairy like these, but they're very, um, they have, uh, they're very um, charming because of the color. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's all yeah. black. Yeah. Yeah, some species can be a lot more different colors than others. Uh, mm -hmm. Like the red squirrel we're drawing can be, uh, you know, other um, grayer colors as well. Um, right. Oh, right. yeah, we mentioned earlier about the gray squirrel from North America has actually been introduced to Europe and is more competitive and is out competing the red squirrel in some areas. So they're having to do some work controlling that. <laughs> oh, we have an issue here in New York and um, Connecticut with people who brought in coyotes. Huh. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, and they're not natural to the habitat, and they're causing problems with the wildlife and with even, even people's pets. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got to watch out for that. Yeah. Yeah. It was not a smart thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> they did it for a purpose, I think, to quell the deer, yeah. but the overpopulation, but um, it wasn't too smart. No. Yeah. Coyotes generally don't eat deer unless it's a fawn. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do, well, you know, is there, do you know if there's a species of black squirrel here in North America, or is that just the color of our normal gray squirrel, a variation? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I've got this book here, but it would, um, I don't, you know, I haven't been out in the East Coast, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look through All here. Right. I All right. I just asked you in case the CPU. Someone knows. must, someone must know in that's watching today, but yeah, I don't, I don't see, but we have a, a lot of species. 
Uh, yeah, I, I can't find it right now. <laughs> okay. That's Sorry, I don't know. Okay to do. Thank you, though. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, you. great. I enjoyed well, your lecture very much. Very nice. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, great. So thank you, um, everybody. Let's see, I'm just going to play this a bit more. Nancy has seen black squirrels in Western Canada. Yeah. And Jacqueline wants to share and she has a question. Okay. So I clicked on Jacqueline's name and I paused the video. Yeah, if anybody knows what that squirrel might be, I don't know. Okay, Jacqueline, we're waiting for you to come on up. You've been live before, so I think it works for you. She's going to try to wrap this up in the next 10 minutes or so. Oh, that's it. The Eastern gray squirrel has a black face. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> so just like that red squirrel has a gray face. So yeah, 487. Yeah, so there's there's a picture here of the Eastern gray squirrel normal picture and then the black face picture. Yes, Nancy says apparently the gray squirrels in Europe are introduced and carry a virus that can kill the red squirrels. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, good. Yep. Eastern gray squirrel. All righty. Oh, Linda said, are you traveling? Are you planning on offering travel workshops in the future? Uh, Linda, thanks for that question. I know I've mentioned that before. Um, so for those of you who are new, uh, I have uh, offered uh, sort of sketching holidays or vacations to tropical places like Honduras and Mexico. And uh, since the pandemic, I have um, traveled. Well, no, before the pandemic, I went to Costa Rica and scouted for six weeks. And then last year at this time, I scouted in Ecuador for six weeks. And I may be going to Australia to do some scouting. So um, I, I usually do lead these uh, week-long trips where um, people come and we uh, sketch uh, birds and mammals and flowers and whatever. And they include uh, access to all my courses so you can practice beforehand. Um, so I'm still trying to organize that and uh, partner with um, tour agencies to do that. So I'll get back to you on that. Uh, I do have, let me see, I'm trying to click here on my website to show you as we wrap things up. Um, I'm putting in the chat box the link to um, my web page. Um, that I call my Birds and Blossoms Nature Sketching Tours. And that has some um, videos uh, from previous uh, tours, uh, like in Honduras, uh, and to give you a taste of what I do in the field. So it's really fun. Anyway, anybody else want to share? I'm just continuing now to add some shadowing here. So Jacqueline, I did cl click on your name. It says accepted, so it's just not coming up yet. Sometimes it takes a minute. So I'm adding um, some shadowing. It looks kind of odd right now because it's a kind of heavy shadow on the, on the back of the tail. But as I keep going, it'll look more natural, getting more three-dimensional. We've just got a few more minutes before they're going to cut us off because I have a two hour limit on my plan here. Um, yeah. 
Now there is a donate button. So if anybody feels like donating, you can click on the link below where it says donate. I really appreciate any kind of donations. If you're not already a member of one of my paid courses, I do appreciate a, a small donation of any amount. Uh, it um, shows me that you were uh, learned something from this class and yeah, and you were inspired by it. Eleanor asked if I can share my final picture. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I did two of them. So this is working on him for about maybe 15 more minutes um, after the end of this video. So I just continued to, to get some three-dimensional form. Uh, again, not trying to make a biological illustration, but trying to make something. And um, I just clicked on Karen in case you want to join for a couple minutes. And then here's another version I did of the same guy in just a different color of pencil. Jacqueline, yes, I did have a class on drawing mammal fur. It's part of my um, my course that I gave the links to uh, called Sketching Mammals of the World. So it's got um, separate two-hour workshops on fur, moving animals, heads, feet, all of that kind of stuff. So I go into a lot of detail. So, yeah. Okay, we just have a few more minutes. Karen was trying to come up. Thank you, Eleanor. Oh, there she is. Just a sec. Let's get you up here. Let me get you up here, Karen. There we go. Karen's live. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm trying to be better at going fast. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's no, you don't have to, uh, but I just like to push people to give them the confidence to sketch in the field and learn from nature. <laughs> wow. These are my quick sketches. Great. Yeah, I like getting just putting those angles in there. It's important. Didn't get too fat, far on that. And then this is my progress on this guy. Oh, great. <laughs> You're really starting some nice details on the head. I love that. Yeah, I'm going to finish that in color pencil. And my husband said I had to share this. <gasps> oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I have some decorative gourds on my table as well. And my pet rats will um, chew on those when I'm not watching. <laughs> yeah, this is my gourd picture from your class. Oh, and it was just, just on this white piece of paper and it was driving me crazy. And then we walked out and could tell that something had eaten my gourds. So, <laughs> so he said, why don't you draw some rats? And so... <laughs> I actually got a couple pictures off the internet, so I don't really know if they fit my my uh, my area for wild rats or anything, but I had fun with them. Right, right. Yeah. Usually, you know, they are going to be um, more gray or brown. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the one on the right looks kind of like my rat, Dulce. <laughs> yeah. But that's so, cute. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Take care, Karen.
think we're just about almost out of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for today's event. I hope you were inspired a little bit about the diversity of the rodents of the world and how they're a lot more familiar than you might think because you may have had some of them as pets or some of them in your backyard. And uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, practicing uh, live sketching some of those species. And you can always check those links in the chat box over there um, or anything on YouTube to practice sketching some rodents some more. You can always come back to this replay at the same link above and uh, watch again. And yeah, I hope you uh, keep going on your shading uh, of your little squirrel. So I know it's challenging to try to make them cute, but um, it, it takes it takes some practice. <laughs> okay, well, have a great uh, morning or afternoon or evening, wherever and whenever you're watching us from, and take good care. Bye-bye.